the difference in the sort of uh, democratic countries like Switzerland, for example, where I live, uh, or the UK or the US, has been that we've uh, really had to bank on the trust of people, on how, how people trust their government. Like in Switzerland, you know, we trust the government to make the right decisions, so we voluntarily follow the rules. In Germany, people kind of follow the rules, but they don't entirely trust everything, so there's lots of people who don't follow the rules, right? And in America, people follow the rules of the, uh, the personality, not, not the government. Right? So, if you're looking at what happened, for example, in China, it's quite clear that a more sort of uh, state system and where the state is in charge of everything has made the response easier because there are less issues to concern yourself with like privacy and data security and all those things, right? So the bottom line is I think that I don't think that totalitarian countries have fared better. Look at, for example, Iran, but that wasn't the case, right? Uh, I think that democracies and free countries like New Zealand, for example, fared really well because of the culture of how they already did things before Corona. For example, a strong emphasis on public health care, uh, the government listening to people, having more of a wise leadership. The same is true for Iceland and of course also for Switzerland. So basically, I think in a nutshell you can say that the COVID crisis has made the bad things worse and the good things better. Right? Has essentially amplified what was there before. Like here in Switzerland we trust the government, so now we trust the government to do the right thing about Corona. You know, Milton Friedman's fam famous quote, right? Um, things only change when there, when there is a crisis, real or perceived. And what people do in the crisis depends on the ideas that are lying around. Right? And I don't usually quote uh, Milton Friedman, given that he's the inventor of extreme capitalism <laughs> and hasn't really done good to many people. Uh, it's, it's quite clear that um, this crisis has triggered responses that are changing our world. And it would be kind of an insult to people who, who, had a, who are having a very difficult time in the corona crisis to call that beneficial. Right? But there are beneficial side effects. Uh, for example, just to list a few of them, uh, in Europe we have learned that we have to help the other countries, like Italy, southern countries, even though we don't really feel comfortable with how they're spending the money, but we have made a decision that we have to do it. Right? Solidarity is more important than efficiency. And that is a totally new thing. Right? And basic income, for example. Now we're thinking, well, if the government is already paying for people to stay afloat, we're essentially paying a basic income in many countries, in many professions, in many sectors of the industry. And so the thinking about basic income has been advanced. Right? So other good things that have been included is that we are all of a sudden appreciative of uh, other humans. So we're realizing how much it meant to us to, to hang around the water cooler or you know, to, to go out and connect with others. And we've also found that technology is a great solution and can really help us and can really get us into the future. But at the same time, what we really want is not so much about technology, it's about other people. So these things are all egged on. And now as we're going into the future, uh, I think we've learned that being prepared and trusting science and collaborating in science is the solution. Whether we're going to roll that over into climate change or AI or genetic engineering as a learning, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. The other thing that goes with this is that, you know, the realization I think that most people have is that uh, humans are very, hard, uh, very hard to get to consider things that don't already exist. Like, you know, we usually respond to things. So we responded to Hiroshima and we had the nuclear agreements we responded to COVID to deal with that and we only did it when it happened and now we've learned that maybe we have to respond before things happen and plan and prepare. Right? Very important point. Yes, in a post-COVID world we I think we have to be realistic and say that vaccination is going to make a very big difference but it's not going to be the universal magic wand. Uh, for many reasons. We have to be realistic, I think, and say that these kind of pandemics and the things that are happening with viruses and other uh, medical 
things that are happening and biological things that are happening will be the part of our future. So I think we're going into a with corona future uh, and in some places a sort of post corona future. But the threat of this will continue and our behavior change, for example, how we assembly, how we protect ourselves and what kind of objection we have to uh, uh, vaccinations and so on. That is going to be an ongoing debate and this is not going to end this year. So. As I like to keep saying about the post-corona world, we're not going back to normal. We have to give up on this idea that we're going to go back to 2019 and resume flying and resume spending money on all these things. Uh, there is no vaccine, for example, for the climate crisis. You know, we're moving from one crisis to the other and living part in a crisis is going to be part of our future. And so what we need to learn is resilience, collaboration, creativity, agility, and we need to work together to solve those problems on an ongoing basis. You know, we are living with the COVID crisis, we're living with the climate change crisis, we're living with technology, and so we have to adapt and figure out how to exactly deal with that. Now, I'm not so worried about that becoming uh, a standard procedure that people would think that we don't need other people around us because you know, in the end, I think human nature is very much about doing the things that are not allowed right now, like hugging and spontaneous feelings. And uh, I think that's going to make a comeback when it's safe to do so. Um, I don't think that people will become more aloof or distant or, you know, machine-like just because we have this kind of safety rules in place right now. In fact, I think that most people who are now uh, engaging online and digitally, they want nothing more than to actually continue that process in real life. So we're looking at the future as a hybrid, as a hybrid situation. We're going to work from home, we're going to work from office, we're probably going to have the benefit of both. And, but if we ignore what people are all about, which is not data or information or algorithms or, you know, data flow, um, then we end up with bad results. As I said many times in my speeches before, uh, the biggest danger right now is not that machines will take over, but that we become too much like the machines. Uh, and I think that, that is something that we have to keep a good eye on. When we think about the impact of Corona, of course, uh, there are huge cultural differences in different countries, depending on where you started with, right? For example, in Brazil, it's quite clear that there has been more inequality as a result of Corona. And in the US, there has been social upheaval. You know, we probably would be looking at another four years of Trump if it hadn't been for Corona. Uh, and so the, the results are all different everywhere. But there are some results that we see pretty much across the board. One is that people want to make sure that healthcare and uh, the social things that go with healthcare, that they are well planned and well thought of and well laid out. Right? So one of the key things that people want is to be prepared. So that has shifted a lot, a lot of money has shifted into the healthcare sector. And other things that have been a result of Corona is that people are really uh, asking the public officials to be smarter and quicker and more responsive. So a lot of thinking about the traditional sort of populist strongmen like in Italy or in, in Hungary or of course in Brazil, uh, have been questioned because they have been so utterly ineffective. Right? So there, in a nutshell, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things about Corona that have changed the way that we look at things. Right? For example, we're working from home, we're m missing other people, so all of a sudden we're saying, hey, maybe it would be more fun to go to the office. You know, we're actually uh, rethinking the idea that it all has to be digital. Right? So there's a, whole of, uh, a lot of things that have changed in our narrative and in our mindset. Yeah, there's a significant challenge in that the things that are sort of exceptional now because there's an emergency and the things that are considered to be emergency uh, uh, legislation and regulation, that they become the new normal. For example, tracking on an app or constantly checking up on people or constant rules about everything and mingling of the state with the free market and all of those things there's a chance that some of that becomes sort of the new normal. Like in Israel, you know, where the, uh, the government was using tracking systems that used to be used for warfare on their own citizens. 
or Singapore for that matter, where all of a sudden the rules that were kind of there for COVID have become rules to keep. And I think it's a real concern when you look at what happened in the last big crisis in America, you know, uh, September 11th, when the Patriot Act and the Fees Accords and all of the things that were considered emergency response, they became a way, a way of life and they haven't changed, right? America is still under emergency regulation. And I think this is a real job for government officials and, and of course the public and civil society is to make sure that emergency regulations don't become the new normal just because it would be convenient to have them continue. Right? So there has to be an exception to the uh, difficult situation. For example, I think if we're going to have a new rule for climate change and carbon taxes, maybe we do that until it's, it's done and then we find another way of doing the same thing better. Right? This is an important uh, challenge, of course, as we look at governments. Yes, as far as uh, automation is concerned, clearly we are facing that automation is a, a much more of a driving force, a changing force in impact than globalization. Because we're going to automate anything that can be automated, pretty much anything. So automation, digitization, virtualization, robotization, I call that the mega shifts, right? So when we take automation, it's quite clear that we're looking at a scenario where anything that does not require human ingenuity will be automated. That is, for example, call centers, uh, searching for, for data verification, uh, simple legal work, uh, of course production work, driving and so on. But the learning is from the last past years is that things can be automated and routines can be automated, but most of them can't be 100% automated. So basically what's happening is that, that automation is not taking away our jobs, it's taking away some of the tasks. Like, you know, now I sit down and I schedule meetings, you know, whatever, or I do research to find facts. And if I don't have to do that anymore, my job changes, I can move up the food chain. So what automation has always done, uh, in most cases at least, is to make people move up the food chain and do other things that only people can do. So a simple example, you know, used to have about 90% of people in Europe worked in agriculture 100 years ago. And now it's less than 2%. So what happened here is we used lots of machines, make it more efficient, create other jobs. The danger is, however, that we won't be ready, that we won't have the skills to move up, or that there won't be any funds for us to learn how to be less like a machine. I mean, the bottom line of that automation topic really is that if you work like a robot, a robot will take your job, and if you learn like a robot, you'll never have a job. So automation is one of those things that's sort of like, it could mean this or it could mean that, but in the end, I think it's quite clear, it will happen on the broadest possible level in the next decade, and we have to get ready to move up the food chain and give those simple routine jobs and commodity jobs to the machines. So human nature really is, in the end, that we don't actually feel the need to move until we have either pain or love, mostly pain. Um, and that we're not very good at, at preempting pain. Right? So we usually have a situation and then we say, oh God, now, now we have to do something. And then we do it actually very nicely, like uh, the nuclear non-proliferation agreements, it took, I don't know, what it was it, uh, 1968, 20 years, right, for those to get done, but they're in, in effect now and they're working. COVID, if we hadn't responded like we did, using technology and AI and scientific collaboration, we would never have a vaccine in like 14 months. We'd probably have 30 million people dead. So we are good at responding and then collaborating under pressure. We're really lousy at looking at something and saying, this is coming, what do we do? Like climate change, or artificial intelligence domination, the singularity, or genetic engineering, or geoengineering. So I think it teaches us that we need to have people who are thinking about what's not already here, who have, who have ideas and visions. And this is widely done in the tech business. Right? So Jeff Bezos and, and Tim Cook are thinking about things that that don't exist, that may exist, and it's all unknown. And so we have to have a lot more of this, and this is why I have always made the pitch that we need sort of a council of the wise people. 
uh, a global council, an ethics council to think about possibilities. And we have to teach this to our kids, to have one leg in the future. And this is just a question of, as I like to say, uh, the future is not about tomorrow, it's not, a mind, it's not a time frame, it's a mindset. Well, I think the main thing about a mindset is kind of like a character trait, you know. You, a mindset is not something you can download, <laughs> or you don't go to a university to get an MBA to get a new mindset. Going to get an MBA will, will change your mindset, right? But a mindset is something like a character. So some people are shy, other people are introverted, and yet other people are completely extroverted, or you know, they, they are social or asocial, or whatever the, the case may be. And we have to change our, we have to grow our character into what is possible to do with it. For example, the future mindset is a decision to say that you're going to spend time on something that's important. This is just like the mindset to keep up your body and, and, and not be obese or to practice or to work out. There's a certain point of a decision-making process uh, when you're facing a reality and saying, well, I realize I haven't done this. The way that you build your mindset is by nurturing it. Uh, it's not by uh, installing something or by looking at a spreadsheet or reading a research report. That's kind of like resilience and agility. You know, some people are extremely res resilient and other people are struggling to be resilient, but they, they can't know, they can't find out how. It's like creativity. If you go into a group of people and you say, now be creative, right? well, it doesn't work that way. This is, these are character traits that we have to develop. And if, if you're in a company that is not resilient and it's not creative, then you have to start on developing the characters in the company and you have to create room for it. So this is why it's so important when I speak to people about uh, the future mindset, part of that is the experimentation and the playing. To go back to be able to play and to try stuff and not to be afraid of what happens. And this is why cultures that have more fear generally speaking, are more afraid of thinking about the future but because it requires taking a leap. And this is why America is so great at the future, right? Because taking a leap is like a daily uh, or an hourly occurrence in America. It's a, it's a cultural question. Right? So bottom line is when you think about the future mindset, that requires a cultural change uh, in the organization and a character change in yourself. Yeah, what people think about the future, it's been an interesting development, I think, uh, the, essentially the last decade, is the future is branded by either Hollywood or Nollywood or Bollywood or Hollywood, uh, whatever you want to call it, Nettie Wood, uh, is that people create media that is almost always uh, dystopian and negative because that's, that's what sells, right? It's like an action film that is real life, in, in a way. And so that has flooded the channels about AI and machines and all this and then we have the tech companies who are uh, pushing out products that kind of look like what's in the movie and that scares people even more right? and then we don't really have a lot of public debate about the future about the positive part and then we we see in the media of course all the bad results of what is being published we don't see simple facts like Hans Rosling and many others have pointed out and Max Rosa and so on is for example how poverty has improved how childbirth death has basically not gone away completely, but largely, uh, how we're all getting older, except for Americans, uh, and all of those positive facts. And so the story of the future is dominated by negative things, and we have to definitely change that, because my view is that we have all the keys to a good future, science and technology, if we make the right decisions. And that's why I'm an optimist about the future, because it's just about making the right decisions. It's not about not having the tools. And so the fear of the future is one of the worst things that goes on, especially in Europe. Uh, because when you go to Asia, to like Vietnam or China, do they have fear of the future? Not really. They, are, they feel like the future is theirs. <laughs> and why is that? Well, this is a cultural question. We need to reset our culture to be more optimistic about the future, to know more about it and to be creating it. The 
the way that we deal with monopolies, of course, is, uh, is to first to realize that they are monopolies and to analyze it. I mean, it's, it's funny when we look back at, at uh, oil companies or gas companies being regulated or banks or telecoms being regulated because we realized they were too good in building up all this power and dominating and pushing out uh, competition and so on. But it was obvious with oil and gas. And it was obvious if we let the oil companies continue to drill in the coast of California, we'd be looking at results that weren't pretty. And now the problem is with data and technology companies that the results aren't so obvious. You know, we see the data pollution and the surveillance and the, the uh, abuse of data. We see that all in front of us, but it's not like you're going to see the oil coming out the ground or something. You know, it's, it's, it's less tangible. And so really what it requires again is uh, government and politicians and public officials and of course the civil society uh, is to bring those issues to the top and not constantly swipe them under the rug. And it's also important to see of course when we talk about technology that the story of the future has been dominated by technology because they make the future products. And so there we can say the biggest example for how that has been derailed is social media. That started as a good thing, something that we could all appreciate, and I did for a long time as well. Uh, and then we realized, you know, they've become so powerful that they're invincible. And this requires, of course, personal restrictions, like I left Facebook as a result. Tough decision to make. But it does require uh, supervision and accountability and regulation and new social contracts. And this is something we have to do much quicker than we have. So we're going to see in the next decade uh, a rehumanization of technology. Because I think a lot of people are getting fed up with their, their essentially being the, uh, they're being the fodder of technology companies, uh, especially in social media. So there's going to be lots and lots of positive change there. Again, we learned after it happened. In many ways you could say technology is kind of uh, a lot like a drug or maybe even a religion or both. Uh, a certain doses of it uh, is probably doable depending of course on your own likings but we don't prohibit smoking entirely or drinking alcohol or drinking coffee or eating. We say that if you overdo it with eating yeah, you're going to get sick. If you drink too much there are rules about that. So we have rules, we have social contracts, we have distribution laws and all these things to deal with those things. And this, the same we have to do with technology. So we have to basically say at a certain point, it should not be legal. Like, should you require that women give birth in a machine, right? Exogenesis, because it's safer and faster and cheaper than having a real life birth. You know, those things exist. I mean bizarre stories here, right? Should the company be able to require you to virtual to wear a virtual reality helmet so you can work a hundred times as fast? And I would say, well, if people want to do that because there are certain missions that they have to do wearing these outfits, that's one thing. But a requirement, I think, is dehumanizing. So we need to have rules, regulations, and also social contracts that say, you know, at a certain point, leave the mobile phone off the table because that is what everybody else is doing, right? It's a social contract, it's not a law. And imagine in 10 years when we have quantum computing, augmented reality, virtual reality, holograms, uh, and, you know, we can be superhuman. So there is going to be very important that we find out sometimes we can be superhuman, but we also want to be human right? to protect what makes us human. I think the, the decision-making process is difficult because it's culturally different. Uh, so in one culture it's perfectly okay, for example in Korea, in South Korea, 80% uh, of people who are commuting in the evening, they buy their groceries using a QR code that hangs on the wall of the subway. <laughs> and they never go to a store, they buy their food with a QR code and people think that is normal. Uh, of course there's no real disbenefit to it. but. It's, it's a, just an expression of culture. And of course in China people think of privacy entirely different. In Singapore people think of the laws of what you can do when you're outside and, and how you're moving about and the tracking and stuff as different. So 
I think we have to come down to the bottom line of really simple things to define those on a global basis. For example, the right uh, to protect your own data and the right to give access to that data and a universal system for digital ID. I mean, imagine what happens when everything that you are is turning into data. So your, 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 your body data, your DNA, your biomes, your phenotype, your movements, you know, what we have today, but times 1,000, that could be very beneficial, for example, for fighting cancer. But we'd, we would need a sort of depository, a way of, of me controlling what I want to give to others or not. Right, right now we have basically, the, it's all fair game, right? and that won't work. So clearly we're going to need ways of putting it into place where we have safeguards and protection, but not the disbenefit of barring ourselves. Yes, well, the internet business model is, is of course, ancient now. And it, it started off in a completely different direction in, in terms of what people were doing on the internet. And it, it wasn't really prepared for it becoming such a commercial vehicle now. And I think the challenge is for us to, to say, how do we reinvent the, the, the tradition of making money on the internet, which essentially is data tracking and surveillance and selling information and you know, things that most of us would consider to be abusive, in the extreme at least. Right? So the answer to that is we're probably going to end up paying a lot more for the things that we want, you know, paying for privacy. I can see a time where we're going to pay a basic fee to put our data in a locker, uh, for example our healthcare data, to make sure that we have the right to remain private. Right? I can also see a time where companies are going to have an entirely different policy on their data because they're getting a lot of pushback from people for abusive use of that data. I think we're, we're right now at this sort of uh, intersection where the old internet clearly is violating many things and well the new part will probably not even be called the internet but the digital network of the future will have to be reinvented in so many ways. For example uh, Tim Berners-Lee is doing that right now with his project of creating a, such a data locker. And that needs to happen, I think, in the next decade as well. When you look at what privacy is, I think privacy really is a human right because it involves things like mystery and secrets and mistakes and allegedly free will, whatever the definition of that would be. So, right, so as, I'm, as I'm private, I am enabled to do those things. And that's why I think it's really a, a digital right that's very important, not just a principle. How we express that, that privacy right, I think, needs to be partly regulated and partly optional. So, of course, you know, when I'm rich, I have other, uh, I have other things, you know, I have other advantages I can do with that money. I can probably be more private rather than less private if I want to, or if I'm really rich, I'm not private at all, of course. But you know, the bottom line is, I think it'll be a combination of my right on privacy that the state has to safeguard. The more we connect, the more we must protect kind of idea. And then there's optional things that I do with my privacy, like I can buy a $10,000 mobile phone that's utterly private, that nobody can hack if I have $10,000 there. That part of it, I think, is just part of economics and business and and that's the, the prerogative of people who want to do that. But it does have to be a basic setting, like, you know, every human has the right to work, has the right to self-realization, right? has the right to exist, has the right not to be killed. <laughs> uh, and basic other rights should be, uh, as I laid out in my book, should be on top of this right, so digital human rights, as I call them. Yes, well, how much of a problem is capitalism? I mean, of course, capitalism is the problem. Uh, not capitalism per se, but the form of capitalism that we have now, which is extreme capitalism or corporate capitalism. We have not found a very good alternative for capitalism. Socialism, communism has expired as, as an option, really. Uh, but many components of that are interesting for our future. So really what it comes down to, as long as we have a very simple rule, which is a one-track corporate mind and also personal mind, that says it's profit, growth, GDP, more money, more stuff, more goods, 
and that's been very ingrained in, in many societies and many many roles and many people of course as long as we have that then everything else is like a second choice to that so we always make decisions based on the outcome on objective number one if we do that then it's heading towards self-destruction because we're no longer in the position of where we can take all these things that were previously available like natural resources and when we're, we keep prioritizing the taking but not the giving then we end up in a place where everything is taken, which means, yeah, kind of an implosion. So the, the real problem is when you, when you work in a company that has the objective that it's all about functioning and production and optimization and margin, then you become like that. And everything you do is about furthering that. And this is why it's so important that leadership and companies create this opening. And you're looking at the most successful companies, primarily in technology, but also in other brands, how they have done this, like Patagonia or Unilever or in technology companies like, like um, uh, Zoom and others, you know, who are creating a flat structure or like Salesforce, even better example, that gets a push forward from everybody so you can discover those kind of things. And that is, of course, again, a question of culture. This is why I say uh, culture eats technology for breakfast. You, you don't change a company just by bringing in technology. Uh, in fact, you probably make things worse because you're making the things that weren't working more efficient, so they're even working less. Right? You have to start with the people and the culture. A more sustainable future, I mean, we, I, it's. I think this is happening in people's mindset already in that they're realizing that what we are doing is, is not just unsustainable in terms of environment or energy, but also humanly unsustainable, for example, in inequality. And if you put all these things together, you have a bunch of peaks about what is unsustainable and coming out every day even more. Like in the COVID crisis, we've learned that uh, our healthcare system and the way that we take care of people in many countries isn't sustainable, it doesn't scale, it's not very well funded, it's not coordinated. We found all the weaknesses uh, and as a result now we're, we're bolstering and investing in that system. And how do we make our, our world more sustainable? I think first the conviction that it does need to be preserved. And that is essentially the process of understanding what's already happening. Uh, and to detach ourselves from this sort of simple way of living based under the GDP rule, which is profit and growth and, and general advancement in economic terms. I mean, we've always had this issue, uh, basically until now, until the COVID crisis, that economics is the most important thing. Every government is talking about economics and jobs and growth, and, and we say, well, there was 2% GDP growth or so. But of course, we all know that the principle of uh, GDP does not include most things that are important to us, back to what Bobby Kennedy said about it. And we have the Gross National Happiness Index from Bhutan, we have the, the, the Gross National Progress Indicator, we have all these things. We are only going to act on this if we're finding out that the old paradigm is broken. And that is what's happening right now. We're seeing that the old paradigm is broken, we need to reshift. Uh, and we need to figure out how we're going to spend our future based on the new paradigm. As far as globalization is concerned, the discussion has been raging in the last year or two that, that we're going towards what's called a slowbalization, which means you know decoupling supply chains and bringing things back home and and, and, and reshoring things and all this. And I think this is happening also as a, as a response to the current crisis, of course. Right? But let's face it, I mean, the future of the world is not decided in one country. And whatever we do, or China does, or America does, will to a certain degree be beneficial for them. But in the end, we have global issues, right? Energy, water, food, disease, technology, you know, all of those things that we have together. And so. It's funny, at the same time, I think we're going to have a deglobalization in practical means, like supply chain maybe, for a while. But then we have a lot more multilateralism, which is collaboration on the top level issues. How do we keep the planet? 
how do we how do we make food right how do we grow food how do we uh, create more water and solving all these things together so it's kind of at the one hand we're, we're uh, tend to be more isolationist now and on the other hand the need to act together is is exploding right? because climate change will not be addressed in one country or by one company and all of the top level issues lead only to one conclusion which I believe roughly in 20 years we're going to need a sort of global government to deal with those issues, not in the sense of governance, but in the sense of making top-level decisions that people have to abide by. And we have precedent for this. So I think basically what's happening now is that uh, COVID has accelerated us like a warp drive into this new reality of realizing what we can do if we set our mind to it and what we have to do. Yes, well, how do you make change on the societal level? Well, <laughs> I think we've had change on societal level by outside occurrences and disasters, like COVID, like September 11th, like things that happened to us where we have to respond to. And that is what we have to change. If we're going to wait until we have 300 million climate refugees to act on climate change, well, that, that's probably going to be very late and very costly. We may never recover. If we're going to wait for a machine with an IQ of one trillion to take over the world's infrastructure in electronic ways, we may never survive that. So we generally change because of those things, because we see them and then we respond. So we have to switch this mode and say, we're seeing this coming and with a little bit of foresight as famous futurists like Alvin Toffler or Buckminster Fuller or Marshall McLuhan have always said, you know, this is not hard to see, then we have to take it in as a possibility of reacting before it happens. So again, this is a mind sh mindset shift from the focus of, of to on today to a hybrid focus. Today, half today, half tomorrow, right? To ask the questions, what if? And this is, of course, a crucial change in politics as well. You know, this is what we have to ask of our politicians. I've always said that we should have sort of a driving test for the future, like a license for the future, for every public official to make sure they can imagine the future and they can act from the future. So I think this is going to be uh, the number one change in the next 10 years for a lot of people on the, in the leadership team is that they become sort of a little bit futuristic in their thinking because the future is happening faster than we think and it's exponential. The future is not gradual. You know, we're leaping. I mean, check out what happened in the car industry. In just 10 years, we've leaped from the diesel engine being the, the most important development project and now the diesel engine is dead in just 10 years. I mean, so the future is happening faster than we think. Who leads the world to change? That's an interesting question because, you know, in the COVID crisis, we have learned the successful countries of dealing with the crisis. They were both privileged, like New Zealand, but they also had a different approach to life and to governance and to their country in general. Uh, and many of them were run by women. So what this idea of emotional intelligence and, and connecting to things and respecting nature and stuff that has gone out the window in so many places. Iceland, right? Uh, South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand, compare that to Brazil or the US or the UK, right? Who leads the world in the future? Well, I think it's quite clear that people that can see uh, in, in a more holistic way and that can see the context, and that goes for CEOs and politicians and futurists and, and, and you know anybody in the world, the new leader is capable of seeing all these things at once and all the implications of it and understands it intuitively with imagination. And that's the leadership that we need, you know, people who are able to express that, like Yacinda Ardern in New Zealand, who is uh, sort of a walking embodiment of this kind of concept in so many ways. But then again, if Yacinda Ardern was, uh, you know, a politician in France, it probably wouldn't work. So I think we're, we're looking at the next 10 years as at being that point where we have to recreate that renaissance, you know, that we had in the 15th century, which was new realizations, new emphasis, uh, new priorities, where all of a sudden in the renaissance we said, you know, the uh, religion, and pope and dogmas and all that's all good, but in the end, you know, it's about 
what humans can do. So it was a huge shift in bringing forward the Renaissance and of course the, um, all of the changes that came with the Renaissance. And now all of a sudden we're having this, what I call the, the new human Renaissance, which is to say what we want you know, is more important than what we can have. We have to decide on what we want. And the future is not something that just kind of falls down on us. And, and we're looking at it passively. You know, we're, the, the future is not predetermined. There are people who are discussing that to be predetermined, right? But, but it's not. The future is something that every time I, I make a decision, whether it's yes or no, active or passive, I shape the future. Um, and so the question should not be, what will the future be? This is a stupid question, right? I mean, it's like, that's like saying, you know, uh, you know how will this egg be scrambled as, I, as I'm standing there with the pan? You know, it's not like that. This is a process where we say, what do we want the future to be? What do we prefer? And what choices do we make? We have all the choices. It's not that we don't have enough choices. We make the wrong choices. Egg Buckminster Fuller once said, we create the right technologies, but for the wrong reasons. So we have to, we have to look at our reasons and our preferred future rather than the options. Well, the thing about resets with people is always a result of something that happens to us. Or it's a, some, it's a result of an experience. Like, you know, I remember when I went to the first Burning Man, which was still in San Francisco on the beach, you know, I realized the power of music and the power of getting together and the power of what was happening in person and this kind of event shape, how important that was, and it changed my life afterwards. And then when I wrote my book, Technology versus Humanity, I realized when the book came out and people were engaging with the topic, uh, how important this conversation has become. And I was a little bit precedent talking about it, but it was not there yet. But So you have realizations and then you make a change. And I always compare this to therapy. You know, you go to therapy not because you, you're dying to go to therapy, uh, because, because you must, you know, you're in a bad shape, you're in a jam. Something is about to, to die or to break. So you go there and then at a certain point you have a penny drop moment you know, to where you say, okay, I got it. If I do this, then this results, right? You, you get it. And so this is how we reset our lives and also our company's life by having those penny drop moments. And this is of course part of my work is to create those moments and to help people find those moments. Right? There are always, I think in everybody's lives, sort of penny drop moments, realizations where you realize, yeah, that's true and everything is different. This is always like when I was a musician, I had a penny drop moment when I had a lesson with a super famous jazz musician. And after about 47 seconds, I realized, you know, I was an ant and he was a, a dinosaur. You know, I just couldn't get anywhere close. So you have those penny drop moments and that's when you decide that you take an action. And this is what we need to create.